So I'm going to talk about some of our worst noxious weeds. Um, worst can have a variety of definitions. And in my context, I am picking some of the weeds that I find myself uh, either battling or advising property owners on battling uh, most commonly, um, regardless of their frequency. So, um, or maybe it just might be, you know, their danger. So uh, I'm gonna do a quick overview of the noxious weed laws for those who haven't uh, learned about this before, and then I will get right into the weeds. So, you know, once in a while, it's okay to go into the weeds, right? Okay, so are my slides going? There we go. So what is a noxious weed? Um, noxious weeds are non-native plants that can cause ecological or economic damage. Um, they have a variety of characteristics. Sometimes they're aggressive, sometimes they're toxic or poisonous. Um, sometimes they're difficult to manage. Uh, sometimes they're very competitive. They could be highly destructive for a variety of things, you know, the environment or even your fence lines. Um, and sometimes they can carry hosts or uh, there may be a, uh, sorry, an insect carrier or a disease carrier or host, those types of things. So um, there's a variety of reasons that noxious weeds are on the list. Um, we have about 154 species um, I say about that because I try to count them and every time I get a different number. So it might be 156, I don't remember. Um, but about 150 some species on the list, it's quite a bit to keep up with. Um, we strongly encourage people to control noxious weeds because of their damaging impacts. Um, they can cause a variety of types of damage. They can lower crop yields. They can reduce your forage quality if you have uh, pastures or hay. Uh, they can destroy habitat for a variety of uh, living beings. They can displace native plants, clog waterways, decrease your land value. Uh, also, they can increase erosion if they are some of our uh, streamside noxious weeds. Um, some noxious weeds increase the wildfire risk, especially things like scotch broom, which are highly flammable. Um, in some cases, they reduce recreational opportunities, whether it be via waterways or other uh, public lands, and then sometimes they are toxic, as I had mentioned before. But the number one reason that you should control noxious weeds, maybe number two or three, depending on your perspective, is because it is a state law. Um, the law is written to limit the economic losses and adverse effects um, from, that noxious weeds cause to our agriculture, to our natural environment, and to our human resources. Um, if you want to read more about that, you're more than welcome to uh, search the noxious weed law. It's RCW 1710. Um, you will also find the state noxious weed list listed under chapter 16750 if you're interested in seeing all of the species and where they are designated for control. So noxious weeds are divided into a classification system. Uh, class A noxious weeds are uh, the most uh, limited in distribution. They are targeted for eradication. So um, anybody who has a class A noxious weed must eradicate that species. Um, basically do everything you can to prevent it from spreading and get rid of the plants altogether. Class B noxious weeds are uh, more widespread and um, they are more prevalent in some areas of Washington and less prevalent in other areas. So the idea behind class B weeds is to draw a line around their current infestations throughout the state and try not to let that expand. So we're aiming for containment and reduction. Um, rather than eradication. Uh, we have about, I didn't mention this, we have about 37 class A species and 66 class B species. Um, of those, we do have eight class A species here present in Cowlitz County, and about 40 of the class B species are documented here in the county. So class C species are far more widespread. Um, they might only be of interest to the agricultural industry. Uh, they may not have other threats or things like that. Um, in terms of enforcement, the county noxious weed board can choose whether or not to uh, select class C weeds um, for control, but ultimately they are generally a lower priority. Um, we do have about 51 species of class C weeds and probably 30 or so of those are documented in our county. Um, our most common class C weed is Canada thistle, um, Bull thistle is another one. There are a few others. So um, just kind of a, a summary of the classification system. And as I talk about the weeds um, on the, I know it's at least on the first page of 
each weed that I'll talk about, there will be a letter in the top corner, um, either A, B, or C, and that's what this is indicating. So um, if I don't mention it, that's, that's what to look out for. Um, also, as I talk about controlling these weeds, I just wanna highlight that controlling noxious weeds almost requires using an integrated pest management approach. Um, you could just choose one method and maybe you're fine with that, but you're going to have the most success if you choose a variety of methods um, to control that. So integrated pest management is the combined use of various control methods to manage your pests. Um, it improves the efficiency of each of those control methods when uh, combined together and reduces environmental impacts. Um, IPM considers the timing, the characteristics of your plant, the characteristics of your site, um, the plant phenology, when they're flowering, when they're sprouting, when they're doing whatever they're doing. And it also includes monitoring as well as other factors. So um, you, you can't evaluate the success of your treatments if you're not monitoring. And especially with noxious weeds, many of our weeds can have viable seeds for many years. So monitoring is extremely important to ensure that all of the hard work you've put in doesn't go by wayside if you skip a year of um, monitoring and treatment. So uh, you can't know what's out there if you're not paying attention. So monitoring is extremely important, I think often overlooked. Um, when we talk about different control methods, um, I'll use the terms biological, cultural, herbicidal, and mechanical. Um, what I mean by that is um, biological is using one organism to control another. So that might be utilizing insects to uh, reduce the population of a weed. It might be managed grazing and it might be introducing pathogens um, to control a weed. Um, they're not the most common method for um, control because biological control classically is never 100% effective. Um, if you were a insect relying on a plant for your main food source, um, you would probably want to preserve some seed for next year so that your uh, population can continue to thrive in the future. So thinking of it as a survivalist mode, um, biological control is never 100% effective and it does take a lot of time. Um, you do not ever see instant results with that. Uh, maybe more instant with your grazing, but the insects and the pathogens take a lot of time to uh, put an impact on a population. Um, cultural control methods are altering the environment uh, or the surrounding environment to uh, reduce the likelihood of your weeds sprouting. So that might include fertilizing, mulching, or using a cover crop. Uh, herbicide methods are, uh, you probably know what those are, but there are various ways of applying herbicides that some people don't think about. So uh, foliar spray is the most common. Um, that could be done with a backpack sprayer, a hand sprayer, a boom sprayer on the back of an ATV or a truck. Um, but there are also other ways of applying herbicides. Um, sometimes herbicides can be injected directly into a stock. Uh, you could potentially be painting them on with a little sponge. Um, you could be using a pre-emergent, which stops the plants from uh, sprouting altogether. So there are a wide variety of approaches that you can take if using herbicides. Um, and then always reading the label if you do use herbicides. I know uh, master gardeners are generally not able to provide herbicide advice um, because they're not licensed, but um, the staff, the inspectors in my program and myself are all licensed with um, public consultant, public operator and consultant licenses. So um, you can always come to ask us if you need herbicide advice. Um, and then lastly, mechanical methods. So this is what the majority of people do. Um, and it's also a really important method uh, for many of our weeds. Um, but that would include cutting, digging, hand pulling, mowing, using your tractor to cut everything down, brush hogging, um, using a weed wrench to get the roots out, anything that you are doing to physically control the plant um, with something other than herbicides, basically. So um, when I talk about integrated pest management methods, that's what I'm talking about and why it's important. So, okay, um, so let's move on to what are the worst noxious weeds and how to control them. Everyone has their own definition of worst, but I am going to um, bring you into my world a little bit and see if any of these weeds you consider to be your worst. So um, the first one I wanna talk about is knotweed. There are actually four species of knotweed here in our county. Um, and I'm gonna review those here. Um, but knotweed is a very, very aggressive perennial plant and it tends to invade stream banks and riverways, but it can also appear in an ornamental garden, 
or um, any unmanaged land that may have had dumpings from um, other sites. Um, it can come up in the floodplain as well. So it spreads very rapidly. It's very aggressive and it's very, very difficult to kill. Um, it flowers, it has these really nice white panicle flowers on it and they do produce seed. However, it is seed is it's not, is not its primary mode of reproduction. Um, typically this plant spreads by either underground rhizome or fragmentation. So if a plant were to break off in a flood and float downstream, or if a landowner were to cut this and leave it on site, it can re-sprout and develop a new infestation somewhere. So um, the four species of knotweed that we see on this slide and we have in our county um, include Japanese knotweed, which is the most common. It is um, probably the smallest of the species. Um, I'm going to skip over to the opposite side where we have giant knotweed. Uh, you can see the picture there. The leaves get quite large, um, about as big as a car window there. Um, so giant knotweed is the largest of the three uh, of the species. And then bohemian knotweed I want to talk about next. That's in the lower bottom. Um, that one is a cross between giant and Japanese knotweed. So um, it has characteristics similar to both. And then the fourth species of knotweed, which we don't do a lot of uh, discussion about, is Himalayan knotweed. Um, it's just as invasive and aggressive as the other plants, same treatment methods and all that. It's just far less widespread. Um, we do have this in Kalama on the river, um, and I think maybe one other location in our county, but primarily what we're seeing is either Japanese or Bohemian knotweed. Um, we do have giant knotweed in our county in a couple of locations. I know Hatchery Creek and the Kalama River have it, um, as well as up on the Delameter, I saw it today. Um, so we do have giant knotweed here in the county too, and it's it's quite interesting to see. So um, typical knotweed features. Um, so let's see, where to start? Um, it does have a hollow stem, and you'll see in the center picture there, um, the stem has some red tinge color to it. Um, if you look at the leaf structure, um, the leaves are either heart-shaped to triangular, and um, they come off of a red stem that almost zigzags in pattern. Um, I have not seen a branch that is fully straight um, with leaves on it. Um, the stalks often remind people of bamboo. They have very prominent nodes. Um, and the flowers are a white uh, panicle flower that come off the top. It usually starts blooming in August. Um, so we're just starting to see the blooms come up on most of our plants. Um, this year, I feel like everything is delayed by a couple weeks. Um, and knotweed is no exception to that. So you'll start to see the flowers coming on in the next couple of weeks. Um, the lower picture is just a photo of what it can do to a stream bank if left unmanaged. Uh, you can see some plants are there sprouting in the water um, amongst the log jams, um, as well as fully taking over that one side of the bank. Now, I don't know what's happening on the other side of the bank, um, but that's a, an example of how aggressive it can be. Um, let's see. In trying to decipher between the species, um, giant knotweed will have the same leaf shape. Um, you can see some heart-shaped leaves there, same white panicle flowers, but the uh, flower length, so the height of the flowers is going to be about a quarter of the size of the leaf. Um, giant knotweed will also grow anywhere from uh, 10 to 12 feet tall. So it's much taller than the other knotweeds. Um, and the leaves can grow up to a foot um, in length. So they're, they're very large. Um, going a little bit smaller, we have the Bohemian knotweed. So this one has, um, is again, a cross between Japanese and giant. And this one, the flower length is about half the length of the leaves. So when we're looking at ratios here, um, the flowers appear to be larger, but they're half the length of the leaf. Um, this one will grow anywhere um, between eight and 12 feet. Generally, eight is kind of a, a good estimate, um, but otherwise similar features. Um, the Himalayan knotweed has a much narrower leaf, uh, but can still invade. Um, it still also has the white panicle flowers. And then, oh, I didn't put Japanese in here. Silly me. Um, Japanese is essentially similar, although it grows about six feet tall. Uh, in most cases. So um, in terms of controlling knotweed, so knotweed is very aggressive and um, it does not respond well to mechanical methods. 
So cutting this plant will actually encourage growth. Um, trying to dig this plant is very difficult because the plants uh, typically have roots about, it could be up to six feet deep. Um, so making sure that you're getting all the roots and all the rhizomes is extremely important if you were to be digging this because every root fragment can regenerate a new plant under the right conditions. So uh, it's very difficult to get this under control by digging. Um, some people say that they have success with frequent cutting, but you would need to cut it every two weeks for probably six to seven years um, if you're going to try to um, control this. It grows very rapidly. I think it can grow about a foot or so in a week or two. So um, it's very a very quick grower. Um, and then some people suggest putting a loose fabric over the top and then flattening the plants out every other day. Um, again, that would take many years to get that under control. Um, I often don't even advise to use the mechanical methods with knotweed because it takes so much attention and would be very difficult for most of the infestations that are here. Um, we do almost always recommend a chemical treatment. Um, we have injection guns that are available so that you can inject the uh, herbicide directly into the stock. And then we do also have the foliar spray option. Um, so those are uh, generally very effective methods for controlling knotweed because it allows the um, herbicide to get down to the root system. And timing is just as important as uh, choosing your method. Um, we generally treat knotweed in the late flowering stages for the most effectiveness. Um, it can be treated a little bit sooner if you, all you can do is treat it at a certain time. Um, but in an ideal world, you would treat it right after the flowers are pretty much done. Um, at that point in time, it takes all of the resources down to the roots as opposed to trying to put out flowers. Um, there is a new uh, biological control that we are experimenting with for knotweed. It's called the knotweed psyllid, Aphelaria itadori. Um, and it primarily focuses on, or it seems to be most effective on giant knotweed. Um, so we do have one experimental site going in our county. Um, we've been working with the WSU uh, biological control program um, to monitor that. So uh, I'm really hoping to see some good results on that. But like we said, with all biological controls, it takes a lot of time. So um, we're monitoring that population. Um, and then in most cases, planting native plants can always help to control noxious weeds. Um, so if you have not weed in, this would be my preferred method of uh, control. Do not cut or mow your knotweed. Enjoy the flowers and then spray uh, just after the flowers are fully bloomed. Um, a foliar spray would be sufficient. And then if you have any in sensitive areas, you could use an injection gun. Um, if you have nearby plants you're trying to protect and then monitor and follow up um, as needed. So um, any questions about knotweed before I move on? Okay, I can also answer questions at the end. That's totally fine. Okay, so the next one I wanna talk about is giant hogweed. Um, my reasoning for this being one of the worst is it is uh, very dangerous if you were to get this on your skin. And we recently found uh, one infestation of this in our county. And that's the first time that we had it documented. Um, so giant hogweed is a perennial plant. Um, sometimes it can be biennial, but generally it's a perennial. It does reproduce by seed as well as through perinating root buds. Um, it's very, very toxic to the touch. If you get this clear sap on your skin, um, it sensitizes your skin to ultraviolet radiation and therefore um, causes severe burns in the exposed skin areas. Um, those burns can last for as long as, or the scars from the burns can last for as long as six years and the sensitivity to sunlight can continue even beyond that. So um, getting this on your skin is not just a short-term issue. Um, it can definitely be uh, painful for many years. So it's something I don't want to see any, anyone exposed to if we can avoid that. Um, so this is kind of a top priority to get this under control. Um, it does have a very similar lookalike, uh, cow parsnip, which is native. Um, cow parsnip typically flowers about six to eight feet tall, whereas giant hogweed typically flowers about 15 to 20 feet tall. Um, so we're looking at a significant size difference in the plants. Um, you can see here in the photo, it has a um, kind of a circular umbel shaped flower. 
Um, those flowers can get up to two and a half feet in diameter, so they're very large. And then it has some smaller flowers coming off to the side. Um, you can see the, the leaves there. Um, they are kind of palmate with many indentations in them, serrations around the edge. Um, the stem is also hollow. It has um, very stiff hairs along the stem and often red to purple blotches all throughout, usually raised bumps. Um, if you have any questions about giant knotweed or think, or sorry, giant hogweed, and you think you have it, even if you think it could be cow parsnip, give us a call and we can help to uh, determine its true identity um, because they do look very similar. Um, in terms of control for giant hogweed, um, there are no biological controls available for this. Uh, it's been said that um, sometimes cows may graze on this, but I wouldn't rely on that as a control method. Um, and the impact on their skin is unknown. So I just would keep the animals away from it altogether. Um, and there are no bugs available or pathogens. Um, providing native competition is always a good thing. Um, but honestly, if I had giant hogweed, hog, bleh, giant hogweed um, I would use a foliar application on this. If it was in a sensitive area, you could do a stem injection as well because it has a hollow stem. Um, if you are going to be handling this mechanically, I would 100% wear a full body suit, long sleeves, gloves, thick gloves at that, um, long pants, and probably even protect your face so that you don't get um, any of that sap on your skin. Um, so you could cut down the flower stalk if it was flowering, and then um, young plants can be dug out um, very carefully. Larger plants can be cut and then dig up the root system as well. Um, so that that would be a, a reasonable method as long as you're using proper protection. Um, so again, if I were to be removing this on my property, any small plants I would either dig up or spray. The larger plants I would cut and then dig or inject some herbicide into the stem there. Um, and if it was flowering, I would definitely be cutting the flower stock down and removing that, putting it in the trash except if you're noxious weeds, then you try to preserve it for display, um, but put it in the trash and um, spray any remaining vegetation that's left. Um, because it is a perennial, it will continue to come back if it is not killed or removed completely. Okay, uh, tansy ragwort. So um, this is one of our most common noxious weeds. A lot of people battle this um, throughout the county and have been battling this for many years. Um, so tansy is a taprooted biennial. Uh, if you continue to cut this or mow this in the same fashion year after year, it can turn into a perennial, um, but most often it is a biennial plant. So after it flowers, that plant is dead and um, new plants may come up in its place. Um, it does reproduce by seed and it is very toxic to livestock, especially horses and cows. Um, it's very high in alkaloids. So uh, as little as 3% of an animal's body weight in um, ingesting this can kill them. So it's not something you want to keep around um, and it's something you wanna to try to protect your neighbors from as well. So um, very toxic. It does have uh, these very nice yellow disc flowers with only, or sorry, many disc flowers with only 13 rays around the edge. So if you were to count each of those ray flowers surrounding the center, there would only be 13. Um, some other distinctive features, the very base of the uh, stem and the, of both the leaves and the stem has purple on it. So you'll see that um, the, as a first year plant, uh, tansy is a small rosette or a clump of basil leaves. Uh, they look very frilly if you were to find it kind of sitting on its own. I, I, I like to think of it as a pile of frill, um, but that is definitely not a botanic term. So um, it has purple at the base and um, yeah, it grows up to five feet tall, maybe six feet tall um, in good conditions and it loves sunshine, disturbed areas especially. Um, we see tansy come in after disturbance, especially logging um, or other areas that may have brought some existing seed to the surface. So um, that is tansy ragwort. Um, there are a variety of ways to use integrated pest management to control this. Um, I would say first and foremost, if this is on your property and it's flowering, you should always cut the seed, the flower heads off and put them in the trash. Um, plants that are pulled and left on site can still produce seed 
and therefore just prolong your issue. Um, you could also cut it at the base or pull the plant out completely. As long as you're putting those flowers in the trash, um, that's kind of the biggest prevention method going forward. Um, because it is a two-year plant, um, you can treat this with herbicide or you can dig it up um, when it's in the rosette stage. And on the next slide, I'll have a photo of that. Um, but treating it at the rosette stage and learning to identify it then is very impactful in trying to control your tansy far before it flowers. Um, repeated mowing is on here, um, but what I've seen with people who repeatedly mow it is that it repeatedly flowers and doesn't actually get rid of um, the plants there. So um, it's not the best method. Um, it says on here to dig out with caution. Some people have mentioned to me that they have a skin reaction to tansy. Um, it's not often, but it happens. So if you do have sensitive skin, I would suggest wearing gloves if you're handling this plant. Um, for chemical control, there are a variety of herbicides that can be used on this in the fall or in the spring. Um, generally a foliar spray works well on this. However, if you are treating it with herbicide once it's flowered, it's kind of a lost cause. Um, you're treating a plant with herbicide at the end of its life cycle anyway. So if you're going to be treating with herbicide while there are flowers, you should cut the flower heads off and then treat the plant so that it doesn't try to put up more flowers. There are a couple of biological controls available for this. The cinnabar moth is the most well-known. Um, it was released throughout the county um, back in the 70s and 80s, and I think they even released it in the 90s, um, but they stopped releasing it because it also feeds on other species in the Senecio family um, at higher elevations. Um, it's still very widespread in our county. I had quite a few caterpillars on an infestation I was looking at a few weeks ago. Um, so it can have an impact, but again, with all biological control, we don't want to um, let those plants go to seed, which is what the bugs are gonna let it do. Um, there's also a ragwort flea beetle and a ragwort seed fly, um, both of which, as I um, asked our um, biological control representative, she said that they're very prevalent in um, on the west side of the state, so they're likely here. Um, we just don't see them as often as we do the cinnabar moths. So they help to keep the tansy population down, um, but our help is still needed to prevent them from flowering. Um, also, if you have um, healthy pastures, if you fertilize or um, provide some other native competition, that can help to outcompete the tansy. So um, all good things to keep in mind. Um, if I had tansy on my property, I would be removing it or spraying it at the rosette stage. Here are two different pictures of rosettes. Um, the first one is more of a seedling, very young. You can see the purple in the stems there. Um, the second one is a more developed plant. Um, the leaves grow about six inches high or so. Um, they can get up to about 12 inches long, so it can get very large. Um, if it was bolting, you could either cut it or dig it up or spray it um, as long as the buds are not developed. And then uh, if it was flowering, you should hand pull or cut the plants and put them in the trash. So that's what I would do if I had tansy on my property. Um, Canada thistle. So this one is one of the worst weeds because it spreads and creates very dense monocultures very quickly. Um, it is rhizomatic and it's a perennial species. So it continues to spread underground um, even when it's mowed or um, if the plants are, the flower heads are cut off, it will continue to spread underground and basically outcompete everything around it. Um, it quickly invades, uh, especially in pastures and outcompetes native plants very readily. Um, also when it is near crops, it can reduce the crop yield because it takes it so many resources out of the soil. Um, let's see, in terms of identifying it, uh, typically this plant grows about two to five feet tall. It has uh, very slender grooved stems. They branch only at the top. Um, the flower heads are in tips, are, are at the end of the stems, usually in clusters. Um, they're one and a half, or sorry, one half to three quarters inch in diameter. And they usually bloom from June to October. Um, I think Canada thistle started flowering in July this year, just because everything is behind. Um, there are bracts underneath the flower heads um, and the leaves are definitely spine tipped. Um, the leaves are alternate with, um, let's see, the margins are smooth to spiny. So um, yeah, it's one of those prickly plants that nobody wants to grab. 
And then um, let's see, let's talk about control of this. So you can use mechanical methods on this. Um, you can repeatedly till at seven to 28 day intervals. And after three to four months of repeated tilling, um, you should have exhausted all of the uh, root stock and the rhizomes that are underground. Um, and it will also prevent it from flowering if you're tilling it. Um, repeated mowing can weaken the stems and especially if you do so in the late spring, you can help to deplete the resources. Um, I don't know how often repeated mowing indicates, but I would say every probably five to seven days would be um, necessary to keep to weaken those stems. But overall, if you're just cutting it to prevent the flowers from seeding um, or just cutting it to try to get rid of it without a strategy, um, cutting it doesn't kill the roots. So um, you have to really work at it to uh, get all of those resources used up. Um, in terms of cultural methods, you can do competitive crops such as alfalfa or forage grasses can help to outcompete Canada thistle. Um, and then just providing healthy pastures and native competition is always good. There are a couple of um, biological controls out there. The stem gallfly uh, is a bug that's released. And generally, if you, you might see this out there, um, if you look underneath the flower head in the stem, you'll see a weird ball develop when this uh, bug is present. And that ball prevents uh, resources from getting to the flowers and therefore it doesn't produce seed if those are present. So it's not doing anything to kill the root system, but it is preventing it from spreading by seed. Um, there are also um, some damage has been noted by insects, nematodes, and apparently the American goldfinch, but we do not really rely on those as uh, biological controls per se. Um, foliar sprays can be very effective on this, both in the spring and the fall. Again, I wouldn't treat this while it's flowering. Um, the resources are going to all the wrong places when you're treating during the flowering stage, uh, but fall treatments is what I typically recommend to people who are really struggling to get this under control. Um, so again, if this are on my land, um, I would prevent it from flowering if that's when I discovered it, um, whether that be by repeated cutting or whatnot. And then I would follow up with a spray treatment in the fall, possibly the spring, depending on how the fall treatment goes and what the fall weather is like. Um, that's always a factor in herbicide treatments. Um, and then plant desirable vegetation and monitor to keep these out. Um, there's nothing worse than getting rid of a noxious weed of any kind leaving it to be bare ground and then additional noxious weeds coming in. So um, in terms of removal, you should always have a desirable vegetation plan and get that put in place um, in an appropriate time frame to prevent reinvasion. Okay, um, scotch broom. So this one is very common in our area. Most people uh, know what this is right around the May time frame. It, we see it flowering bright yellow. Um, a lot of people have allergies to this as well, so it has become quite a public nuisance in that respect. Um, but it is a perennial shrub and it does reproduce by seed. It forms very aggressive monocultures and um, it's very toxic to livestock and horses. Um, it's also very flammable. The oils that are in this plant uh, burn hotter and light on fire easier. So especially uh, in a firewise landscape, you would want to remove your scotch broom um, to prevent uh, more fuel on your landscape. Um, let's see, most people know it by its pea-like yellow flowers that bloom in May. Um, they then develop seed pods that uh, dry out in the late summer and pop open, ejecting the seeds um, up to 20 feet away from the plant if it has a really good ejection method. Uh, the shrubs range in height anywhere from three to 10 feet. Um, as a perennial species, the species does not flower for the first three years of its life. So oftentimes um, a landscape will go unmanaged and nobody notices that there's scotch broom there until the third year when it starts to flower. Um, it, the leaf on this is very small. The stems are relatively unnoticeable in terms of looking out across a landscape and you could kind of see right over them when they're not flowering. Um, but once they've developed the flowers and then the seed pods are quite noticeable. Um, and the stem is very woody, so kind of like a shrub. Um, in terms of controlling this, um, you can definitely hand pull uh, small infestations. Um, if the plants are very young, you may have success just pulling up the plants. 
Again, that's before you know they were able to develop uh, flowers or seed pods. Um, you can also use a weed wrench for larger plants, and we do have a couple of weed wrenches available in our program for lending. Um, if you are trying to get a hold on your scotch broom, um, you can also cut this plant in the late summer during a drought, and um, especially the larger plants that are about the size of a quarter or more in diameter, um, they they tend to respond to late summer cuttings because they don't have enough resources to keep the root system going um, when there's no water in the soil. So that can be a relatively effective method um, in terms of cutting. Um, I've heard that cutting in the spring is not very effective because the roots have enough water to re-sprout from the same uh, crown. So I would, if you're gonna cut, I would actually wait until uh, the late summer. Um, you can provide some native competition and reduce soil disturbance. Uh, Scotch broom tends to thrive in disturbed areas. Um, so that's one way of trying to keep it out. Um, there are two different biological controls available for Scotch broom and um, we have done some releases of those in our county in the past. And uh, there are a couple of sites in which uh, the biological controls um, expert comes to collect um, within Cowlitz County because they are so prevalent. So. Um, one of them is the Scotch broom seed weevil and the other is the Scotch broom brucid. Um, the seed weevil helps to reduce the viability of the seeds. It basically eats them up. Um, so the, the seed pods still develop, but the seeds inside are far smaller and far less viable. So um, that's helpful. It uh, could help long term. Um, in terms of herbicides, you can do a foliar spray um, like most plants. However, with Scotch broom, it's very important to be sure you're covering the entire leaf surface, which can be very difficult because it's so thin, um, but just treating three quarters of the plant will allow those other branches to keep going. Um, you can do a basal bark treatment, which is essentially um, a concentrated herbicide applied in a painting method to the base of the stem. Um, and that absorbs into the basal bark there and can kill the plant that way. Or you can do a cut stem uh, method where you cut the plant at its base and quickly ap apply a concentrated herbicide and that can um, be absorbed into the root system if done immediately. So there are a couple of methods for um, chemical control that may be less harmful to the surrounding vegetation. So um, that's a little bit about scotch broom. Um, if I were to um, have this in my yard, I would try to catch them before the, the first three years. Um, you can see a plant there on the right with no seed pods, no flowers on it. Um, that's the best time to either try to pull or uh, treat those plants. Um, if I had a small infestation, I would be cutting the larger plants in the summer. Yeah, it sucks that they already flowered and seeded, but uh, would scotch broom seeds be inviolable for 80 years or more? Um, waiting one more year isn't going to make a big difference in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I would probably be using a cut stem treatment if I were to be cutting them. Um, for a very large infestation, if it's acres of scotch broom, you could do a brush hog method, um, cut all the plants down. Um, some brush hoggers have the ability to add an herbicide attachment to the back end of it, allowing you to uh, treat the stems following cutting, and that can really uh, increase your effectiveness. And then monitor the area for new plants and repeat the above steps for the rest of your life. <laughs> Monitoring can really help um, if you're, you, you'll start to notice a really big difference after a couple of years. Um, and you know, after some time of controlling scotch room, uh, you will just see a few plants every year rather than many, many plants. So um, it is definitely worth it uh, trying to get this under control. Um, it just can be very intensive in terms of management. Um, and plant some competitive, non-invasive plants, maybe some trees. Uh, Scotch broom tends to like the sunshine. So trying to shade out the seedlings could be really efficient um, long-term if you're wanting a tree canopy. So just some food for thought there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about field bindweed next. Um, field bindweed is on our noxious weed list. It is a class C noxious weed. Um, it is considered a perennial herb. And many people say that once it has established itself, it's almost impossible to eradicate, um, which is why I think it's one of the worst weeds. Um, I'm currently battling this in my own yard and I really have talked to a lot of people who are battling this as well. Um, in addition to a very similar plant, uh, Morning Glory, um, which I'm gonna talk about the differences here in a second. 
Um, so field bindweed reproduces from roots, rhizomes, stem fragments, and by seed. So it's very versatile in its reproduction methods. Um, it has very small leaves. Um, the leaves on this are only about uh, maybe an inch long um, in comparison to uh, the more commonly known morning glory, which has you know two to three inch leaves. Um, just like morning glory field bindweed has a white bell shaped flower. Sometimes they're a little bit pinkish. Um, however, these flowers are only about one inch in diameter, whereas morning glory is about two, uh, two inches in diameter. So uh, quite a bit larger. Um, the stems are generally perennial and they can be deciduous. So, um, the loser leaves over the winter. Um, they twine around other plants and basically try to grow in height that way. Um, my notes say that they can grow up to six and a half feet in length. However, I have uh, shrubs that are about eight feet tall and have um, bindweed at the top. So I think they grow a little bit longer. Um, and then it does um, tolerate a wide variety of site conditions from sun to shade and is very drought tolerant. Um, I have noticed in my yard where I've been controlling it, um, I actually didn't see this start to generate and sprout until uh, we started getting into drought conditions and now it's just exploding. So um, it definitely likes those drought conditions. So, you know, if you were to think of a cultural method, um, keeping the areas that you have this moist may be uh, something that you can do to change the environment around it. Okay, so we'll go into uh, control methods a little bit further, um, mechanical, Generally, it's not a good option because it tends to re-sprout and re-sprout and re-sprout. Um, sometimes you don't have an option other than uh, to mechanically remove it because it's growing up and around your other plants, especially rose bushes or other things that you want to keep. So um, it's kind of a, I don't wanna say a last resort, but it's not the preferred method if you can avoid it. Um, there are some foliar sprays that you can use on this plant um, and the timing varies by the spray that you use. Uh, so you would definitely want to read the label to understand whether you should be spraying it before it's flowering or in the fall. So um, that would be dependent on the herbicide. Um, some cultural things that you can do, um, increase the shade with other plants and continually uh, remove from under those plants so that they uh, depletes the resources. Uh, you can increase your soil moisture or uh, plant some sod forming grasses or bunch grasses that will help to smother out uh, the bindweed. Uh, there is a bindweed gall mite um, that can be used for a biological control. Um, it stunts the plants and reduces the flowering, but again, it doesn't control them completely. Um, so if this were in my yard, I would be preventing it from seeding um, by pulling or cutting it. And then um, as long as there's no flowers on it, I would be spraying it, um, trying to shade it out and increasing my soil moisture to try to get rid of this. Um, I'm almost out of time here, but I think I've got time to talk about one or two more. Um, so I wanna talk about English Ivy. Um, this one is very, very widespread. It's a class C noxious weed. Um, a lot of people are battling this and it's very difficult to control. Um, it's an evergreen perennial vine. It can grow up to 100 feet in length, maybe longer, who knows. Um, it spreads by both vegetative stem and by seed, so it can re-sprout wherever it touches the ground there. Um, root fragments and stem fragments that are left in the soil after removal can also re-sprout. So if you are to be doing removal of English ivy, um, that monitoring piece would be extremely important to keep up on all of the progress that you're making. Um, most people know what English ivy looks like. Um, so it's got that very dark green, um, almost waxy leaf uh, on a vine. It's typically low growing. Um, it does not flower until it starts to grow vertically, which it may do by growing up a tree, a fence, a garage, um, some random piece of something in your yard, um, or it can eventually grow up itself um, by creating such a dense uh, canopy, it grows onto itself and then can flower there. Um, that is one of the things it does is it outcompetes by basically forming a very, very dense cover. Um, it does have flowers on it. They're usually greenish white and umbrella like. They come on in the fall. And then afterwards, uh, it does develop berries um, 
I think they're a dark, dark colored berry, sometimes blue or black in color, and they're very drooping underneath the plants. So again, those aren't going to be on the first layer um, on the ground because it's not going to flower until it grows up. So controlling English ivy. Um, if you have this just in the soil, you can uh, hand pull or dig when the soil is moist. Um, in some restoration projects that I've observed, uh, they basically start to roll the ivy into a carpet roll um, and just kind of start picking it up at the ends and just keep rolling it into itself and try to get as much of it as they can. Um, if you have vines that are climbing up an object, a tree or something else, um, you can cut it at chest or weight height or chest height or weight waist level. Basically, if you just stand there and cut it, what's easy for you, you don't have to even bend over. Um, you would want to cut all of the stems that are climbing. Um, everything that's above will eventually die off. So unless it's uh, an eyesore to you, um, it will kind of die up there and deteriorate. Um, but you want to pull everything away from the lower part of the tree. Um, that's the part that you want to try to protect um, so that it doesn't um, continue to climb. Um, you want to prevent this from rerooting, so removing it from the site or uh, putting it on a tarp to dry out or s some way of keeping it out of the soil um, will help to prevent it from re-sprouting. Um, you definitely want to monitor after removing this plant. Um, you can do a sheet mulch method, uh, usually um, using some cardboard and then some mulch to um, provide some cover and prevent it from sprouting, but you still want to monitor um, if you are not in a burn ban and it's safe to do so around your other vegetation, um, if you just had dispersed plants, you could do a little bit of burning with a blowtorch. Um, I would, of course, do this with caution. Um, you may need to repeat that a few times, but eventually that can help to deplete the resources in the plant. Um, when we look at uh, biological control, there is not any that are approved and available for this. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of animals grazing on this, so. It must not be very nutritious um, other than birds eating the seeds and spreading them. Uh, but there are foliar sprays that you can use uh, to treat English ivy and adding a surfactant or um, it's basically uh, something you add to the herbicide mixture um, that helps to burn through the waxy layer on the leaf um, can really help to improve the effectiveness of your herbicide. And then you can also do a cut stem application. Um, sometimes the ivy uh, stems can be several inches in diameter. Um, and in that case, you could do a cut stump application where you cut it at the very base and then paint a little bit of concentrated herbicide on it. And that would help um, to kill the root system there. Um, let's see. So if I had this in my yard, I would first start by cutting the vines that are climbing the trees, um, remove the matted vegetation at the bottom of the soil. I would be sheet mulching, uh, replanting, and then monitoring. Um, you could work some herbicide in there if you really want to. Um, there's no issue with that. Just making sure that you use an adjuvant um, or, sorry, a surfactant to help um, get through the waxy layer on those leaves. Um, and I think this is the last weed I was going to talk about. Uh, so blackberry, this is also a class C noxious weed. It's very widely distributed in our county. It has some very delicious berries on it. I do love some blackberry pie. Um, but it is an, ever an evergreen perennial. It reproduces both by seed and vegetatively. So um, if you've observed Himalayan blackberry, you may have observed it growing up and over a plant and then coming down the other side where it can reroot. Um, so it's very aggressive in that way. Um, it has a palmate sh shaped uh, leaf with five leaflets, uh, spines on the stem. The berries usually come on um, at the end of the summer. Uh, white flowers precede the berries. Um, the bees love this plant. Um, let's see, the leaves are alternate along the stem and um, the canes that we call them canes or stems um, can reach anywhere from 20 to 40 feet in length. So um, quite long, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so in terms of controlling uh, blackberry, you can definitely dig up the plants if you only have a few um, and you want to do that. Uh, making sure to remove all the roots. Um, you can cut the plants at the base and um, remove and dispose of the stem. And if you do that a few times, you may be able to deplete the resources there. 
Um, prescribed burning can be used to remove the above ground vegetation, but it does not kill the roots. Um, and considering we have uh, quite a few burn bans throughout the summer, I really wouldn't recommend the burning method. You can use goats to graze this, um, but again, uh, goats probably are not worried about surviving and keeping any blackberry for the future. But uh, just that concept of if the goats do eat all of your blackberry back, what are you going to put there, plant there, or how are you going to manage it going forward? Um, just because they may not keep it under control all of the time. And then if you are going to use herbicides on this, um, there are a variety that will treat this. Um, I generally recommend treating it in the late summer or the early fall after the berries have basically started to fall off. Um, as a perennial plant, the plant is taking its resources back to the roots then. So that's also where it's taking the herbicide at that point in time. You might as well enjoy the berries first. Um, the other bonus about treating this in the fall is if you wait just a little bit longer, um, oftentimes the blackberry leaves will hang on longer than some of the native plants. So if this is surrounding native plants, um, they will have lost their leaves and won't be impacted by the herbicide that you use. Um, so that's another bonus of treating this in the late fall. Um, so if I had this on my land, I would be picking me some blackberries. Um, the more blackberries you eat, the fewer seeds can spread. And then um, once the berries are done, I would be cutting the plants back to the ground. That way the canes can be removed while they're still fresh and pliable. I would wait a couple of weeks, uh, two to three weeks for the plants to grow back. And then I would spray them uh, using a systemic herbicide. What that allows you to do is use a lot less herbicide and get rid of the canes because once the canes are dead and drying, they're really difficult to remove and kind of an eyesore. Um, but if you move, remove them while they're fresh, um, you can still use an herbicide on the regrowth, use a lot less herbicide and have a little bit more control um, and then monitor and replant the area. Um, what's likely happened after blackberry removal, and I've seen this multiple times, um, people will remove blackberry, not realizing that the birds have been pretty busy hanging out on the top of the canes and leaving some droppings from anything and every seed that they ever ate. And then when the blackberry is no longer there, all of those new seeds are exposed and you're going to have quite a variety of something coming back um, and it's never knowing where it's going to come from. So I would definitely monitor and consider replanting as soon as you can uh, to provide the competition for what you want to be there and not what you don't want to be there. Um, okay, so I usually end um, stop the weeds and catch the seeds. Prevention is always better than responding after the fact. So um, some things to think about when you're out and about, um, seeds can stick to your shoes, they can stick to your pets, their tires on any of your recreational equipment. Um, they can also come in on new materials that you bring in, um, even from nurseries or um, soil manufacturing, gravel manufacturing places, any new materials, even on hay, um, can bring in seed sources. So uh, if you don't know where your materials are coming from, maybe do a little bit of research and um, try to stop new things from coming in before they establish. So, all right, I see I have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so let me open that up and then I'll also um, open it up to any other questions that um, you may have. Okay, um, Andrea, you asked if I could share the specific sp foliage sprays that I recommend for each. Um, yes, I would love to share that with you. We have fact sheets for each of these weeds that have uh, the effective herbicides on that. Um, they are available on our website, although our website's a little bit difficult to navigate, um, but I can also email you those um, if you'd like. So um, Andrea, if you want to send me an email, I'll put my email in the chat here and I can send you whichever weeds you're interested in. Um, let's see if I can find them on our website too. I think it's under documents and then the Cowlitz County noxious weeds. Can you guys see my screen? Is it showing you that? Okay, I'm gonna guess that you can see it. Um, anyway, so there's noxious weed control sheets under here for all of these. Um, if I were to pick one at random, I'll, I'll pick Tansy because I talked about that one. Um, but the end of it has the herbicides that are recommended. And you always want to read the label to make sure it is marked for the site type that you're using. 
and that there are no other um, restrictions based on your land use. So oftentimes there will be restrictions on grazing, um, maybe if you're haying or if you're using, if you have a forestry operation, um, there may be some different restrictions. So that's always uh, something to keep an eye out for when you're reading the label. Um, okay, here's my email address. Um, if you have, if you want anything specific. Um, Janice is asking where in Grays Harbor County was giant hogweed discovered? Um, you know, I don't know if Grays Harbor County has um, giant hogweed, but um, they do have a noxious weeds program. Um, Kylie's their coordinator, and I'm sure she could tell you if, um, if they've had uh, giant hogweed there. Um, I guess I'm speaking for Cowlitz County, and I forgot to mention that. Um, because I know our Master Gardener things are online and people can come from anywhere. So that's always exciting. Um, Canada thistle, if I pull it every time I see it, one coming up, will that eventually get rid of it? Or is pulling in some way stimulating to driving it to increase? Um, if you only have a few Canada thistle, um, I would say that you could pull it every time you see it because if they're only small plants, you will probably be uh, depleting their root resources. Now it is rhizomatic. So um, if the soil is loose, that's a lot better because you're more likely to get the rhizomes. Um, but yeah, you, if you just have a few little ones, you could probably get away with pulling that. Um, what is a landowner's responsibility to control scotch broom? So um, we do ask that people control scotch broom in a few concentrated areas. Um, we're asking that where it's a high fire danger, um, especially around homes that it gets controlled, um, if it's along a major uh, transportation corridor, we're asking that it gets controlled. And then um, near forestry operations, I think it's essential to keep that under control. Um, if you wanna talk more about that, I'd be happy um, to talk about that. Um, just give me a call sometime. Any suggestions for mares or horsetail? Um, yes, we do have horsetail here. Horsetail is actually a native plant, so it's not considered noxious, um, but we do have a horsetail recommendation sheet on our, our website here. Um, so it looks like we recommend um, mechanical as not being the only means of control. Um, you would want to do something else in addition to mechanically pulling it. Um, I know I've heard of um, others planting some native plants to help outcompete it. Um, and there are a variety of herbicides available for that. So um, I'll put a link to this here in the chat. Okay. Um, and then I, where did it go? You guys are asking a lot of good questions here. Um, how harmful is it to use nearby food crops when you use a chemical product to control weeds? Um, if I were to paint the sponge or chemical onto the weed, will it affect the food plant if it is a foot or so away? Um, the answer to that will depend on the herbicide that you're using. Um, there are some herbicides that do not translocate in the soil. So if you were to do that um, and paint it onto a specific weed, um, it wouldn't translocate into the soil. And then there are some that will. Um, so that's going to be specific to the label. Um, so I, I can only sort of answer that question. <laughs> Um, what about all the class A weeds growing along the roadways? Who's supposed to take care of them? Um, so we do have um, some class A weeds growing along the right of way and we're working with um, the appropriate agencies to get them controlled. So um, if it's in the county right of way, then the county would be responsible. If it's in a city right of way, um, generally it's the city, but I've noticed some of the cities push the right of way maintenance onto the neighboring landowner, um, which I don't think is fair, but um, if you do have some class A weeds growing along the right of way, um, I would just contact us to make sure we know which species is where and um, because we are doing some partnerships to get those under control. Um, when you say treat the cut stem with a concentrated herbicide, do you mean straight out of the bottle? Um, essentially, yes. Um, not all herbicides are approved for this cut stem method. So the herbicide should tell you um, whether or not you can use it for a cut stem method. Um, but yes, in the custom methods that we're considering, um, it would be a concentrated herbicide. So um, it would not be mixed with water or diluted. Um, some of them suggest that you do dilute it to about 50%. So it, that will depend on the herbicide label. Um, what could I plant in place of bindweed on a slope toward a river? 
I actually do not know the answer to that off the top of my head. I apologize, Beatrice. I would have to do a little bit of research on that. Um, but looking at some sort of native plants um, would be the best. Um, but I don't know any species off the top of my head that would be beneficial. Um, probably not like a reed canary grass that seems to be really bad in, uh, in riverbanks. So um, with the photos of young weeds like the tansy ragwort, we like photos of young weeds like the tansy ragwort easier to control when they're small. Yes, um, they are easier to control when they're small. Um, if there are specific weeds that you're dealing with, I can definitely provide those to you. Um, whoever is on said iPad, but it doesn't show me your name. So um, again, you can go ahead and email me and I can try to um, provide you a couple of photos um, for those. And let's see, can you get a secondary exposure to the sap from PPE? Yes, um, I have heard of giant hogweed sap transferring even from pets to a person. So if your pet um, walked underneath the plant and then you later pet the plant, the um, animal, you could get a secondary exposure from that. So I assume the same would be for PPE. Um, any of the uh, clothing that you wear to remove the giant hogweed should be put directly in the wash. So good questions. 